During 1979, the first presidency of the church consisted of President Spencer W. Kimball, Nathan Eldon Tanner as first counselor, and Marion G. Romney as second counselor. Comprising the Council of the Twelve are Ezra Taft Benson as president, and elders Mark E. Peterson, LeGrand Richards, Howard W. Hunter, Gordon B. Hinckley, Thomas S. Monson, Boyd K. Packer, Marvin J. Ashton, Bruce R. McConkie, L. Tom Perry, David B. Haight, and James E. Faust. As members of the presidency of the first quorum of 70, elders Franklin D. Richards, J. Thomas Fiennes, A. Theodore Tuttle, Neil A. Maxwell, Marion D. Hanks, Paul H. Dunn, and W. Grant Bangerter. The first quorum of the 70 consisted of 35 members and seven emeritus members. Serving as the presiding bishopric are Victor L. Brown, presiding bishop, Bishop H. Burke Peterson as first counselor, and Bishop J. Richard Clark as second counselor. Elder Eldred G. Smith, patriarch to the church since 1947, was designated as Patriarch Emeritus. Several members of the first quorum of the 70 received additional callings. Sustained as the Sunday School General Presidency were Elder Hugh W. Pinnock as president in the center, and Elders Ronald E. Pullman and Jack Gosland, Jr. as counselors. Sustained as the General Presidency of the Young Men were Elder Robert L. Backman as president in the center, and Elders Vaughn J. Featherstone and Rex D. Penninger as counselors. We must prepare ourselves both individually and as a church to defend the gospel truths against a world steeped in atheism and godlessness. We must stand firm today and always for human rights and the dignity of man who is the literal offspring of God in the spirit. Being a good Christian means we must be a good citizen of our country, wherever we live. We must be respected and honorable in all our relationships with our fellow men. President Kimball set the example by establishing friendly relationships with world leaders as he visited with Canada's Prime Minister Joseph Clark and President Tanner was warmly received by New Zealand's Prime Minister Robert Muldoon. In May, President Ezra Taft Benson made a month-long goodwill tour of Egypt, Greece, and Israel. He met 17 government officials, including Said Meiri, first assistant to Egyptian President Anwar Sadat, and with Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin. The Prime Minister paid tribute to the church, saying, we have great respect for your church. You suffered much for your faith and have stood by your faith. Five other temples are in varying stages of construction and more are in contemplation toward fulfilling the prediction of Latter-day prophets that holy temples will dot this land from end to end where the work of the Lord is being firmly established. First dedicated in 1884 by President John Taylor, the remodeled Logan, Utah Temple was rededicated by President Spencer W. Kimball in March. Over 200,000 visitors toured the temple prior to the nine days of dedicatory sessions. This temple is special to my husband and I because we were married and sealed here as were our parents our grandparents and some of our great-grandparents. Well, I just feel it's a great opportunity to be able to come and see the prophet and be able to see him in person. My beloved brothers and sisters, these services mark the fourth time in the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints when a temple has been rededicated. It was almost 95 years ago, on May the 17th, 1884, when this building was first dedicated 
by President John Taylor. The acceleration of the temple work which has occurred in the meantime, the development of the new methods and techniques and the heavy use which the facilities have received over the years all dictated the need for the renovation and the additions which have been completed. Now everything is in readiness and we're prepared to dedicate this lovely building again to the Lord. In June, on a gentle rise situated on Salt Lake City's West Valley, President Kimball presided at the groundbreaking ceremonies for the new Jordan River Temple. He addressed a crowd of more than 10,000. All people of good report and worthiness are permitted to visit the temples prior to their dedication. Days, weeks, and months are provided to members and non-members who desire to go through the temple before its dedication. Latter-day Saints in the Seattle, Washington area were excited to see the progress of their temple as the gold-leafed statue of Angel Moroni was set in place atop the temple spire. Later, on October 27th, the temple's cornerstone was laid. Welcoming those gathered was Elder O. Leslie Stone, executive director of the temple department. My dear brothers and sisters, it's a glorious privilege to be here today for this cornerstone service. The first temple to be built in the northwest of the United States. In December, many members of the church in Mexico gathered in Mexico City for groundbreaking ceremonies for a new temple. Elder Boyd K. Packer of the Council of the Twelve presided. This temple is scheduled for completion in 1981. But the basic decisions need for, needed for us to move forward as a people must be made by the individual members of the church. Seemingly small efforts in the life of each member could do so much to move the church forward as never before. One of those members, Utah Mother of the Year, Sister Frances Burtonshaw, was named American Mother of the Year at a national convention in New York City. It has made me realize how much the church means to me and what it has done to make me the kind of mother that would get this award. Because I always, uh, I've been active in the church and I've been on a mission and still came home and still had time to graduate from the BYU and teach school a couple of years before I got married and still have eight children. In May, another Latter-day Saint woman, Susan Wright Brown, was named National Young Mother of the Year. Already the Arizona Young Mother of the Year, Sister Brown, the mother of six children, stated that, to me, the best way that a woman can fulfill herself is by raising a happy family. Now the Lord has said that to every man, woman, and child in this congregation and then in this world who joined his church. Lovest thou me, then show me, show me, feed my sheep. We have in all, in many of the lands of this world, large, fast-growing, delightful, wonderful congregations. And we say to you again, the Lord is saying, feed my sheep. Ten new missions of the church were organized in 1979. In the United States, the Alabama Birmingham, Connecticut Hartford, and Mississippi Jackson missions. In the Caribbean, the Puerto Rico San Juan mission. In Asia, the Korea Seoul West, the Philippines Quezon City, and Taiwan Taichung missions were established. New South American missions included the Venezuela Maracaibo, the Chile Vina del Mar, and Brazil Recife missions. And this increase brought the total number of missions around the world to 175, served by 29,000 missionaries. 
In 1978, Rendell and Rachel Maybe and Edwin Jr. and Janeth Cannon were called as special missionaries to the Nigerian people. Since then, over 1,700 Nigerians have been baptized. The declaration of June 1978, extending the priesthood to all worthy male members of the church, really opened the door to taking the gospel to black Africa. It's a unique experience for missionaries to be able to go into the field and find people in large numbers anxiously awaiting baptism. I think the church will grow rapidly in West Africa. Central to the efficient preparation of missionaries is the Missionary Training Center in Provo, Utah. Succeeding Max L. Penninger, Joe J. Christensen was appointed as mission president at the center. We have about 2,000 missionaries here in residence most all the time, and uh, we're adding new languages as the brethren have made those decisions. We have uh, Polish uh, instruction here for the first time as of the last few weeks. We also will have Greek-speaking missionaries coming in to study within the next few weeks, and even in a few months we'll have those coming to study the American Sign Language so they can go out and teach the deaf. This year, 24 languages were taught to over 14,000 missionaries, evidence of tremendous growth in the missionary work. One new direction is the publishing of materials specifically designed for the Jewish people. They include a set of discussions, a flip chart, and a set of basic pamphlets and tracts setting forth our beliefs as they relate to the Jews. We have witnessed much growth and expansion of the Lord's kingdom. During 1979, the church continued to be one of the fastest growing religious organizations in the world, with a total membership of 4.3 million persons. With 990 stakes at the beginning of 1979, 102 new stakes were added throughout the year. An historic milestone was reached on February 18th with the creation of the 1,000th stake at Nauvoo, Illinois. President Ezra Taft Benson presided over the organization ceremonies. All those who feel to sustain this proposed action that we organize a stake of Zion will you signify it by the uplifted hand. Any opposed by the same sign? The monumental challenge we face is to provide trained leadership for our fast-growing membership and to help that membership to keep clean from the world. To meet the challenge of a growing membership, the Translation Department revamped their program to accommodate requests to translate church materials in many additional languages. One of those involved in the program is Julio Salazar, a former missionary to Guatemala. Well, during my mission, when uh, we started in the Cachiquel Indian program, we had uh, a little uh, red dictionary that some missionaries in the, in the past had written. And then after my mission, I got involved in translating the scriptures. Thousands of miles away, near Lake Atitlan, Guatemala, where Brother Salazar served his mission, these much-needed materials find many uses. To the saints of the Santiago branch, they are an answer to prayer. These manuals are actively used in primary at the Solo Law branch, where the children benefit from standardized instruction. They are also used by the sisters in the Relief Society. These materials are proving of great value during home evening activities to many families. The Botts family, the Cortin family, and the Angelina Tay family. Here, a new convert, Brother Bonifacio Castro, leads the discussion. With the Tay children learning more about the Book of Mormon and their ancestors, as well as important gospel principles. The same program designed to help those in Guatemala is also serving saints from the mountain country in Laos, the monks. These choice people are joining the church in large numbers. Regular Hmong branches of the church have been established in Salt Lake City and Orem, Utah, although no church literature of any kind is presently available in their language. 
Brother Chulai remembers his calling as president of the Orem, Utah branch. My first, I am afraid, I say, I have not knowledge about. So he said, don't be afraid. If you believe God, you can do. President Lai is grateful that some materials are now in translation. The translation will help us a lot, and it will help all the more people in Utah to understand. And before, we don't have too many friends, but now we have many friends. We know many people, and we feel very uh, warmly. A unique kind of missionary work links together peoples of diverse languages and cultures. Brigham Young University's American folk dancers danced and sang in the Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Poland, winning a gold medal in competition in Bulgaria. The sounds of friendship from the LDS Institute at Logan, Utah, performed for audiences in Romania and Bulgaria during a 20-concert tour. Traveling to mainland China, members of BYU's Young Ambassadors performed in some of China's most prestigious concert halls, showing that the love of our fellow men transcends the barriers of language and nationality. This year, the church published its own edition of the King James Bible. Representing over seven years of work, this edition featured a footnote system keyed to all the standard works. This new version contains a topical guide and full-color maps. In September, over 5,000 women gathered on Temple Square for the second annual women's conference. Thousands of others listened to the session over closed circuit, broadcast in four English-speaking countries. Yet each woman faces the challenge of being true to the principles of the gospel if she would improve the quality of her mortal life and make herself worthy of the opportunity of eternal progression. President Spencer W. Kimball, hospitalized at the time of this conference, had his keynote address read by his wife, Camilla Kimball. You can be a much needed force for love and truth and righteousness on this planet. Let others selfishly pursue false values, but God has given to you the tremendous task of nurturing families, friends, and neighbors. Here's one of my chickens for tithing, Bishop. The 1963 motion picture, Windows of Heaven, was re-edited and released to wards, stakes, and missions of the church. I thought the Lord ought to have the best one. With tithing as its theme, the film was shown in special meetings throughout the church. Just wonderful, Brother Gibbs. The saints are catching the spirit of the law of tithing. Fifty years ago today, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir gave its first nationwide radio broadcast. No one expected or probably even dreamed of the milestone we have reached today. Gerald Otley and Donald Rippling are conducting the choir. Robert Kundick and John Longhurst are tabernacle organists. And the spoken word by Spencer Kennard. July 15th marked the 50th anniversary of the first radio broadcast of the themed Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Since 1929, the choir's half-hour program, Music and the Spoken Word, has been aired consecutively 2,604 times. In September, the choir experienced another first in their illustrious history, a concert tour of the Orient beginning in Japan. The Honorable Mike Mansfield, the United States Ambassador to Japan, greeted the choir. The Mormon Tabernacle Choir represents the best in American culture and the American pioneer heritage of the West. On behalf of all of us here, we thank the choir for this visit to Japan, and we want to express the hope that you'll come back again and again and again. On behalf of the government of Israel, it gives me a great pleasure to greet you this morning at this dedication of the Orson Hyde Memorial Garden here on the Mount of Olives. I am grateful and honored to be here on this historic occasion. We gather here to dedicate a park named after Orson Hyde. Most people outside the Mormon... A spiritual highlight was the dedication of the Orson Hyde Memorial Garden. Located on the western slope of the Mount of Olives and overlooking the walled city of Old Jerusalem, the garden is just above and north of the Garden of Gethsemane. A large bronze plaque near the top of the garden has excerpts from Orson Hyde's prayer 
dedicating Israel for the return of the Jews. 138 years later to the day, this garden was dedicated by President Kimball. Some 2,000 persons seated on the slopes of the garden witnessed the presentation of the Medal of Jerusalem to President Kimball by Jerusalem's Mayor, Teddy Kollek. May I ask you, sir, to come and accept the medal on it, on behalf of the city, on behalf of the Jerusalem Foundation, on it as you can look down here, you see this wall opposite, the mosques, the churches, the synagogues, and somehow the artist managed to look even over the hill and see our Knesset, our parliament, and I have the great honor of presenting it to you. <laughs> to the elder Le Grand Richards, who had such a great share in bringing this about. Mayor, you're wonderful. Let me shake your hand. <laughs> wonderful. I wish I would have as strong a handshake as he has. I thank you with all my heart. Elder LeGrand Richards also received the Medal of Jerusalem in gratitude for his $1 million fundraising effort. For Elder Hunter. And you know what he has done to bring this about. He has been with us from the beginning. Not a stone was moved without him seeing to it that it really should be done properly. Thank you very much, Elder Hunter. In return, Mayor Kolick accepted a beautiful statue of Noah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Noah was a double piece, and it is the best symbol that one could receive these days in this city. In his dedicatory prayer, President Kimball invoked the blessings of the Lord on that land of prophetic destiny. We ask thee to accept our humble efforts in helping to create this garden in memory of Orson Hyde. We dedicate and consecrate this Orson Hyde Memorial Garden unto thee and to thy people. This dedication yes, caused many to reflect on how much of Orson Hyde's prayer had already been fulfilled. History was made when President Kimball spent a busy few days visiting various historical sites of the Old and New Testament. Once again, a prophet walked in this sacred land. President Kimball's journey began at the Sea of Galilee and continued to places such as Mount Carmel, Mount Tabor, Joseph's Tomb, the Valley of Elah, and Jacob's Well. The location of this well is one place of certainty and provided an opportunity for a moment of serious study and reflection. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. To quietly viewing a hill thought to be Golgotha, the president's party walked to a choice place, the garden tomb. The prophet reflected upon his visit here 18 years earlier. And I feel quite sure that this is the spot where his body was laid in the tomb. the church's 149th year saw a forward movement in a major way. Great challenges, great opportunities, new plateaus of individual efforts and efforts on a worldwide scale. 
This was the Church in Action, 1979.